Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 134. For new viewers, Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And our feature guest for this episode is the New York based knitwear designer Shirley Payden. Shirley has taught, lectured and written articles on many aspects of hand knitting and crochet and her very classic and sophisticated designs are regularly featured in Vogue Knitting. And Shirley has also authored two books. Her first book was Knitwear Design Workshop, which came out in 2010. And her second book was Duets and Inspirations, which came out in 2021. And in addition, Shirley has led a series of six design alongs where she guides a group of knitters in creating beautiful one-of-a-kind garments. So Shirley is personally supporting each participant throughout the whole process to sharing her wealth of knowledge and experience because she has been designing in the industry for over 30 years. And during our interview, we showcase some of these remarkable designs that came out of the design alongs. And we also cover Shirley's four-step design process. So I have been super eager to interview Shirley Payton since around 2018, and it finally happened last September on Prince Edward Island in Canada. So we were both there for the Fiber Festival and Fortunately, we arrived early enough to film this interview before Hurricane Fiona caused the festival to be cancelled and actually the whole island to be shut down. Mm. So that was a great stroke of luck that we actually got this interview filmed. And Shirley really is a wonderful, charming woman with a huge heart. Our interview is in two parts and it's just filled with valuable and insightful information. So I think you're going to really enjoy it and also learn a lot. Yeah. We're also including another pop psychology segment where I talk about how chronic social isolation and loneliness relate to our health and how knitting can help combat loneliness by bringing people together. Then in Under Construction, we each have new summer projects to share with you and we're introducing a new knit along. So we'll start with me in Under Construction because I've been working on a very lacy summer top by the designer Debbie Bliss. Here it is here. It's another design in a sideways construction. So I'll start first of all by showing you a picture. It's a little cropped top. There's a pretty leaf lace pattern on the sleeve cuffs and under the arms along the sides of the body. And the central pattern of the body is knitted in an easy chevron lace pattern. It's knitted sideways in two pieces and each piece is knit from the sleeve to the center seam. And then at the end, you finish the square neckline and waistband with a one by one ribbing. So this is what I've done so far. I've put it on me so that you can better see how it's constructed. It's very see-through, so obviously you're going to wear a little camisole underneath, and it's very light and lacy. Yeah, it's looking very delicate and pretty. So the whole thing is done in pieces and then seamed together at the end, and you start with the sleeve edge, which is this leafy, leafy lace pattern here. So you knit that for about 10 centimetres, and then you cast on extra stitches on either side for the sides of the body, so mm. along the front side and the back side. And these two edges eventually will be seamed together to form the seam that goes along the sides of the body. So if I can show you down there like that. So once you've cast on those stitches, you've actually got really long rows because you're knitting all of the front across the shoulder and all the back. So you work back and forwards like that across the shoulders until you get to the neckline. And then you're going to divide and knit the front separately and the back separately. But first of all, you cast off a bunch of stitches across the shoulder and that forms the square neckline. And then you knit the front to the center of the body and the back to the center of the body and you stop. And then you do exactly the same thing on the other half of the body, but in reverse. So in the end, you join the two halves together with a three needle bind off and that forms a front ascent, a, a center front seam and a center back seam. And at the end, you also seam up your side seams. So that's how the whole thing works here. You can see I've got a needle around my neck because I've just picked up the stitches for the one by one ribbing to go around the neckline. And when I've done the side seams, I'll also pick up stitches here and do a little waistband. That's also in one by one rib. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm gonna to try to take it off now because it's a really hot day here. And even though this is just light lace, 
the whole idea of having yet another layer on me. Just don't drop your stitches. I know, I know, it's, it's just too much. So bear with me a second. Okay, so this is actually the first lace pattern that I've done with the instructions completely written out and not charted. And I know some knitters really don't like reading charts, but I do. I find them really quite simple and clear to read because they give you a visual image of how the lace is going to end up looking. Mm. And since a chart is a grid and each little square represents a stitch, I just find it so much easier to count the stitches in each pattern repeat on a chart than in written out instructions. And one more little thought, and that is I actually think there's a higher risk in a pattern having mistakes in a written out instructions than in charts because visually with a chart it's much easier to see if a symbol is oddly placed or totally missing. So they're my thoughts on written out instructions versus charting in lace knitting but thankfully this pattern really wasn't that difficult. So you're only patterning on the right side row so every second row is purled so that means you get a break every second row and the chevron lace pattern which covers the majority of the body here is actually really easy. It's only two patterns and you can easily memorize it. And by the way, if you're new to lace knitting, your lace will look pretty disappointing and lumpy bumpy before you block it because it really needs to be stretched out so that you can see the full beauty of the lace pattern. And in this picture here, you can see the two halves of my top before they were joined together. So the top half has been blocked and you can see the lace pattern really clearly and beautifully and the bottom half hasn't been blocked so it's still lumpy bumpy. Well, I think it still looks difficult, to be honest. And actually, I was going to knit this design. Uh, looking at it now, I'm quite happy I didn't. And what you didn't share is that you did drop your stitches recently, and that was a real pain for you to try and pick them up again. That was true. I got lazy, and I didn't put in any lifelines, which is never a good idea. And yep. once lace starts unraveling, it's, it's really, really sad. So there was lots of swearing going on. <laughs> okay, but I want to say something quick about swatching a lace pattern and how to measure it. So a lot of lace over, all over lace is used in things like shawls or blankets sometimes or other accessories where the fit's not quite so crucial. But if you're going to do an all over lace garment like this one, the fit really is critical. So you really need to take a lot of care in measuring your swatch. And just very quickly, I think it's a good idea to measure your swatch before and after blocking it. This can save you a lot of time. So when you've got a decent amount of knitting on your needles already, just while the knitting is still on your needles, I suggest putting it on a board and pinning it out so that it looks how it's gonna look when it's blocked, how you think it's gonna look when it's blocked. So it's just stretched out a bit and then measure it. And this can give you a quick estimate to see if you're on the right track and you don't need to drastically change needle sizes up or down three sizes. So that can save you some time. Obviously, when you finish your swatch, you need to wet block it and measure it again. Mm. But blocking and measuring a lace swatch can feel really subjective and therefore frustrating mm. because it is really hard to know how much you need to stretch the lace lengthwise and widthwise. And that has a massive impact on the final gauge. So I always make swatching and blocking decisions based on how I want the fabric to look. So when I'm blocking lace, I just stretch it until the lace pattern looks just the way I like it and then I measure it and then I make any necessary adjustments. Because just remember that if you have to overstretch your lace to meet the, the recommended gauge, you could easily be warping all your eyelets and also just your stitches won't be lying smoothly. So that's just a little tip from my experience. I have a question. Yeah. Um, how often or how strongly can the lace shrink again over time? I think that depends on the on the fibers. Yeah, okay. Okay, so if it's merino, it's going to pure merino wool with a lot of crimp, it'll shrink a little bit more. But um, and obviously every time you wash it and it's wet, you've got to block it again. So why don't people tend to use plant fibres, for example, that don't have much crimp? Uh, because wool is beautiful <laughs> and it's soft and it's Fair light. <laughs> so you can just sometimes using a blend, a blend of yeah. silk and wool okay, will just yeah. make it a little bit better. Yeah. This is actually pure wool, So, but it's a top and it doesn't, I think it's going to be fine. Okay, so now what it, I also wanted to say that normally a gauge is given in terms of 
how many stitches there are to 10 centimeters or four inches squared. But with a lace pattern, it's easier if the pattern would give you a gauge in terms of pattern repeats. So instead of having a gauge that's written, for example, 22 stitches equals 10 centimeters or four inches, it would say two pattern repeats equals 10 centimeters mm. or four inches, or two pattern repeats equals 15 centimeters. The reason that is, is because it's much harder to count your stitches in lace. So there's often yarn overs everywhere, which really can confuse some knitters. Also in very fine knitting, lace knitting, it's hard to tell, was that a knit two together or was that a knit three together? And in very complicated lace, sometimes you'll get the occasional rows that have a completely different stitch count, but you'll always know how many stitches you've got in each pattern repeat. So if when you're measuring your lace swatch, you're having trouble counting your stitches, measure pattern repeats instead. Just take a couple, two or three pattern repeats, measure that and then convert that measurement into a gauge of stitches per mm. 10 centimeters or four inches. And I've done a little video of me doing that on this lace pattern and that's coming up now. This is my summer lace top by Debbie Bliss and I've been blocking it out on this blocking board. And now I'm going to show you how I convert a gauge to be in terms of pattern repeats instead of in terms of stitches per 10 centimeters or four inches squared. So I've marked this central vertical line here and then I've marked the same spot, two pattern repeats to the right. So from here to here is one pattern repeat, from here to here is a second pattern repeat. And then I'm going to measure the distance between the two pins accurately and take note of it. And it comes to 12 and a half centimeters. So then I divide the number of stitches that are in the two pattern repeats by the distance in centimeters. So each pattern repeat from here to here and there to there has 14 stitches. So that's a total of 28 stitches between the two pins. And I divide 28 by 12.5 centimeters and that comes to 2.2, which means I have 2.2 stitches per every centimeter. So I need to multiply that by 10 to get the final gauge of 22.4 stitches per 10 centimeters. So you can do the same thing in inches if you prefer to work with inches. My tape measure doesn't show inches, but 12.5 centimeters is 4.9 inches. So again, I would divide 28 stitches by 4.9 inches, which equals 5.7, which means that I have 5.7 stitches per every inch. And then I multiply that by four, which gives me a gauge of 22.8 stitches per four inches. So you can see there's a slight variation when you're working with centimeters or inches. There's 22.4 stitches for 10 centimeters and it turns out to be 22.8 stitches per four inches, but it's pretty close. You can choose the same method to determine row or round gauge. You choose a clear point in the pattern. So I've chosen the top of this lace leaf here and I've marked it with a pin. And then normally you mark the same point a couple of repeats up or down from that point. In this case, the maths is very easy because there's a very clear repeat at exactly the 10 centimeter or four inch mark, which I've marked there with a pin. So between these two pins is exactly 10 centimeters because that's exactly on a ridge and this is exactly on a ridge. And what I know is that between each one of these ridges, there are four rows and there are nine ridges. So if I'm counting down, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, right at the top of the, the leaf here. So nine times four is 36. That means I have 36 rows between this distance of 10 centimeters. So my gauge is 22.4 stitches and 36 rows per 10 centimeters or four inches. So I hope that's helpful. So we're continuing in under construction. Summer has finally arrived in Germany and so I'm really in the mood to knit lots of summer tops. But 
Germany's summer only lasts about three months, so yes. I really need to get cracking as I only have until September to knit and wear them all. At the moment, I'm knitting the Sinner Top by Life is Cozy. It's a simple t-shirt with capped sleeves and a lovely boat neck. The vertical stripes are meant to resemble fields of sinner grass which inspired the design, and the pattern gives instructions to knit either a longer or a cropped version. And with a cropped one, you can fold over the bottom edge to insert an eye cord to tighten the garment at the waist, and I'm going to do that. The stripey motive is fairly simple, but what makes the design a little more unusual is that you knit it sideways, although we've been knitting a lot of sideways tops lately. Yeah, so not so unusual for us at the no. moment. <laughs> um, you knit the entire body flat and in one piece, but once you, oh, and that makes it one big rectangle basically in the beginning, and then once you reach the boat neck, you split that rectangle in half to shape the neckline. And both the neckline and the hem have this little two by one rib, and that's important so that your fabric doesn't roll. But I'm sure most of you know that anyway. Yeah, so after you've worked the front and the back half separately, you join the two halves together again uh, to work across the shoulder. And after that, you join the side seams using a three needle bind off. It's going to be so cute. I really love the fresh green and cream together. It reminds me of a splice ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the recommended yarn for this design is a fingering weight yarn made from 70% linen and 30% cotton. I'm using Sandness Garn, which is a Norwegian brand. It's called Tin Line and it's 53% cotton, 33% viscose and 14% linen. The recommended gauge for this pattern is 26 stitches to 44 rows using 3.5mm needles. My gauge is 25.5 stitches to 32 rows, so my stitch gauge is pretty much the same, but my row gauge is looser. And just as a reminder, because the top is knitted sideways, the number of stitches on the needle determines the length, and the number of rows determines the width of the top. Now, although my stitch gauge is pretty much the same as the recommender gauge, I decided to cast on the same number of stitches as the second largest size. I wanted my top to be longer, and this is my belly button here, just as reference. So it's actually pretty short. <laughs> it is pretty short, yeah. Um, okay. I might have to recheck my stitch gauge after all. Um, but yeah, I wanted my top to be longer, partly because I will turn over the hem to insert an eye cord. So we'll see how that all turns out. Maybe I'll end up having a top up to here. Um, yeah. Now my row gauge is looser than the recommended gauge, um, which means that my top would be too wide if I just followed the pattern. But uh, yeah, so I need to remove some rows from the original design. And luckily the pattern includes some easy instructions on how to adjust for a different row gauge. Here is a schematic of the body of my center top. It's missing the sleeve caps. I'm going to take you through how I adjust the number of rows to fit my looser gauge. And you follow the pattern until you've split the two halves for the neckline. I've marked that in pink. Then you put the front half on hold and work the back, decreasing for several rows to shape the neckline. So here you can see the neck decreases and the neck increases. And in between are several plain rows where you neither decrease nor increase. This section is where you modify the garment. If your row gauge is tighter, you would add rows. My row gauge is looser, so I will do less rows in this section. My desired chest circumference is 88 centimeters, divided by two makes a width of 44 centimeters. So in the end, I want my top to be 44 centimeters wide. Now, I measure the width of my fabric up to the last decrease on my neckline. I have marked that last neck decrease in pink. In my case, the measurement was 17 centimeters wide. I multiply that by 2, which equals 34 centimetres. So the top is 44 centimetres wide, minus 34 centimetres for the shoulder, leaves 10 centimetres for the straight edge of the neck. And 10 centimetres in my looser gauge equals 32 rows. Because the stripes on this design look pretty random, it's easy to add or remove some rows from the original design and I enjoyed figuring out how to modify the garment. It wasn't very difficult, but previously mum has always calculated that stuff for me, so I'm feeling a bit more like a grown-up knitter, and I think I'm taking my advice on learned helplessness from episode 124 very seriously. Actually, talking about modifying garments and things, 
I, over the years, I've really enjoyed the freedom of being able to take any pattern I want mm. and modify it to exactly fit my needs or even just sometimes my whims. For example, <laughs> I often change the gauge of a pattern quite radically just so that I can use a particular yarn or because I prefer a different kind of fabric than what the pattern's recommending. So I've learned to change necklines and hemlines and put in waist shaping or change the silhouette completely. I can change a drop shoulder to be a set in sleeve. I can change stitch patterns within a design. And, but I haven't always been able to do this. In fact, I can still remember feeling quite terrified at even substituting the yarn of the same weight mm. than what the, rec the pattern recommended. So, and I attribute this book here, which is Shirley Payton's first book, Knitwear Design Workshop, to giving me a lot of the skills on knowing how to do this. So when this book first came out, which was in 2010, there wasn't much like this on the market. And it really empowered, I think, a lot of knitters because that's exactly what its aim was, to empower the average knitter to be able to take a design and really change it to their own personal needs. So I'll give you a quick flick through the book. The book starts off giving you a strong knowledge of proper body and garment measurements. So there's a whole section also on yarns, stitch patterns and reading charts. And then the rest of the book is what I found most valuable. In clear, simple language, it shows you how to design any silhouette with any yarn weight based on your body measurements. And Shirley takes you through the step-by-step -step process of converting your body measurements into numbers of stitches and rows. And then there's also lots of extra tips on how to get a beautiful finish on your garment as you're knitting it. And the book shows you lots of shaping formulas for changing sleeve caps, and adding body shaping. And there's also a large section on how to calculate the shaping for different necklines, including square, round and V necklines of varying depths. Then there's formulas for shaping all kinds of collars, including shawl collars, classic lapels, Peter Pan collars, mock turtleneck collars and cow collars. And what's really wonderful is that once you know a formula for creating any kind of collar or anything else, you have the freedom to add it to any design you want in the future. So that was a quick flick through this book. If you really would like to have more freedom in your knitting and not feel like you have to be a slave to every pattern that you're following, I highly recommend this book because it really changed my knitting life quite a lot. And Shirley Payden is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a special 50% discount on the electronic editions of her two books, Knitwear Design Workshop and Duets and Inspirations. So Knitwear Design Workshop empowers knitters with the skills to design hand-knitted clothing from scratch to customized commercial knitting patterns. And Duets and Inspiration is a pattern book for knitters of all skill levels, showcasing designs by 16 new and experienced designers, including Shirley Payden herself. So thank you very much to Shirley for this great discount. So now you're going to meet Shirley in part one of our interview with her. I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you very soon on the other side. Knitting, I am so happy to have the knitwear designer and author Shirley Patton here with me today. Shirley has taught, lectured and written articles on many aspects of hand knitting and crochet. Her classic and sophisticated designs are regularly featured in Vogue Knitting and her two instructional books are must-haves in any serious knitter's library. I can personally say that Shirley's first book, Knitwear Design mm. Workshop, is one of my most valued and used knitting reference books. Now Shirley, I have been wanting to interview you since around 2018, yes. so I am thrilled that our 
our paths have finally crossed here on Prince Edward Island. So am I. <laughs> thank you for coming on Fruity Knitting. And thank you for having me, Andrea. Good. <laughs> okay, now, you worked in the corporate world and after an illness, you had a life-changing moment when you decided to become a knitwear designer. Mm -hmm. But at that time, you only had very basic knitting skills. Basic, so, basic. <laughs> so you set about teaching yourself everything from advanced knitting techniques to designing. Yes. So during that period of learning, self-learning, mm -hmm. which authors and designers did you find most valuable and influential? So it was 1989, and two books had just come into the marketplace. And the yarn shops were so excited about them. One was the Bogue Ultimate Book of Knitting. The second was June Hemmons Hyatt's Principles of Knitting. The third book that I used a lot was Mary Thomas's Book of Knitting. Those three books became my key reference books. Also, one of my dear friend's moms, I had Otto Wolfstein, I talk about her in my book. She was a Polish woman. Yeah. She had lived through the Holocaust. She was Jewish. She was also an amazing hand artist, hand um, knitwear, hand sewing. It, her, her repertoire went on and on. And she was a key reference and a key influence to me because she taught me how to see, mm -hmm. how to actually understand pattern movement. And she helped me finish my first design line to put everything together and taught me the importance of understanding construction and construction elements. So I am eternally grateful to her. And she was very proud of your first book, wasn't she? Yeah, finally, after years after her sitting with me to put my first line together, which was, you know, back in the 90s, then I finally had a book because we had constant correspondence and each time she was taking me deeper. Um, she was very proud when I put out my first book, which was Knitwear Design Workshop. Okay, so for those who don't know your work, could you describe what motivates your designing and your aesthetic? The idea of pattern stitches is where I always start. I am so moved by pattern stitches and just the beauty and hooking into an antique craft making art Mm -hmm. It is just um, amazing to me. I always say it's a thread that runs through it. Going back and seeing uh, wedding veils and beautiful items that were all a part of what this whole hand knit wear hooks into. So that all fascinates me. And when I see a pattern or a garment that's visually and structurally balanced, which is something that Ada's just her vision taught me, mm -hmm. then it really inspires me. And that's what I try to achieve in my design work. Okay. And also you had uh, a little bit of a sewing background, didn't you, as a child? Yes. Yeah. Uh, as a child, right up into uh, graduating uh, high school and going into college, sewing and enjoying sewing and understanding uh, garment construction. Mm -hmm. One of my best friend's mother's worked for a famous designer, and she was the first to explain how important it was that a garment would look as beautiful on the inside as it does on the outside. And that was a concept that made me understand what handmade artwork and fine craftsmanship really was. So seeing that, understanding that, and then starting to understand construction elements and knitwear, even though we weren't cutting cloth, we were actually making each stitch one at one stitch at a time everything started to come together to say it's the same general concept but now you're doing one stitch at a time and there is an entire world of patterns to tap into so even though you weren't formally trained you did have very strong influences on a personal one-to-one -one, you know with this designer mother yes who was there I mean that's an amazing experience just to yeah. have her looking over your shoulder yeah. and then to have Ada as well yes. and we've got one of Shirley's most gorgeous designs here on the table and I think this epitomizes your style in my eyes so say something about this so this is uh, my Ada dress it's an ode to Ada 
And if you look, you see the elements and you see this whole concept of what I learned with her of, of patterns echoing. And so you see this particular pattern, pattern running through it. You also see that pattern being echoed uh, in the top as well as in the sleeves. You see this format being echoed in both places. Here we see an echo here with just this tiny detail that I pick up and I pull it across and pull it up into the neckline. Also, the whole concept from my best friend's mom is being able to open up your work and always having the reverse side look as beautiful and elegant as the outside. And you have some beautiful, if you turn the top of the bodice over, you've got some beautiful pearl buttons on the, which is also, yeah. in my eyes, a, a signature of yours. <laughs> just the detail of uh, just having a, a very elegant piece and saying, how do you finish it to really pull that all together? And these little teeny buttons, I think, uh, do that for, for this particular garment. Okay, now you published your first book, Knitwear Design Workshop, in 2010. Yes. And that book then developed into a series of design alongs, which in turn led to the publication of Shirley's second book, Duets and Inspirations. Yes. So could you talk about the concepts behind both books and the design alongs? The idea of Knitwear Design Workshop came about as a knitter who designs now, but remembering the knitting journey and also remembering lots of time in yarn shops when people were frightened to even change a yarn, yeah. thinking they had to just follow the patterns. So Knitwear Design Workshop was designed to say to a knitter, this book is going to empower you to be able to do whatever you would like with your creativity. So if you want to change a V-neck to a round neck, if you want to change a drop shoulder garment to a set-in, a garment with a set-in sleeve, if you'd like to add a waist shaping, whatever you'd like to do, you'll be able to do that and feel empowered with Knitwear Design Workshop. And the concept went really well. People were so happy to have the book. It was like something missing in the marketplace. Yes, yeah, definitely. So when it was introduced, everyone was so happy. Then we thought, okay, so everyone's got the book now. And how do we get them to really use the concepts? And so with the design alongs, we invited people from all over the world and they showed up, which was, you know, wonderful. And we guided them through taking a pattern stitch from a garment that I had used and showing a garment that would be inspirational and saying, okay, do whatever you want with this and use the concepts in Knitwear Design Workshop. I'm here to guide you through as a coach and let's see where we go. And we went many places with that. And from uh, Japanese who didn't speak English to German to Australian and just saying we all speak knitting here. It was just a wonderful uh, series of events. We did five of them and then had so much in terms of just the beauty and elegance of what had been created there. Something to really showcase to the world in terms of just where we could go with basic creativity and taking it to a higher level, then I felt that we should put this into a book format. Duets was then born, and the concept was that they came into the workshop, they took the concepts away, and now let's take a look at what we have. So we showcased uh, garments by 16 different designers in duets, and the last design along, we actually had a competition. So the stakes were higher. Each participant won $1,000. I work in three different categories, lace, cables, and color. So in each of those categories, the winner was going to not only win the $1,000, but to also have their garment in Vogue Knitting for the 40th anniversary. That contest ended in April. It was the most amazing event and now the Vogue Knitting issue is out, and it is just remarkable to see the designs that came from that DAL6. Yes, it's so exciting because Shirley would uh, give them one of their, her published garments that was already a successful, published, beautiful, probably in, in out of Vogue Knitting, oh, and mm -hmm. then they would take 
an element of the stitch pattern, wouldn't they? And maybe you'd covered your whole garment with this very delicate stitch pattern and they would blow it up mm -hmm. and just use part of that mm -hmm. in chunky wool or something. Yes. So it was quite amazing to see the variety that came yes. out of it. Yeah. So it's we like, were all singing together. Yes. It was a duet. Yes. And that's the duets and the inspirations being the pieces. And I just felt like there was this... Uh, the burst of creativity and I always say believe in the power of your creativity and everyone did yeah yeah and Shirley likes to take her students through a four-step design process and that was what you were teaching them in the design along yes so I thought maybe you could give us just a very condensed version of this process using one of your own designs okay. to illustrate yes so the four-step process that was introduced in Knitwear Design Workshop starts with the thought, which is the seed of the idea for the design. And what you're thinking about is what you want to have conveyed through that design. With the profile, meaning giving your design a personality, we ask that you start by writing down everything that you want. Do you want pockets? Do you want a collar? Do you know, whatever you want in that design. So the thought process will then drive the sketch. You take the words and you put them into a sketch format. The sketch will then give you a better idea of what the garment's gonna look like. That will drive the fabric. So we start to say, all right, if I want it to be elegant, what fabric do I want to use? That will drive the swatch. The swatch will then give you an idea along with the sketch of the third step, which is putting together the schematic, all the real technical parts of the garment. That's the pull it all together section of the four steps. That will then have you balancing and making certain that the chart is balanced, that the schematic is where you want it, and then you're ready to knit. That's the fourth step. That's the fun bit. Yeah, that's the fun part. <laughs> yeah. And I always say, before you see a house coming out of the ground, so much work has gone into it. And this is the same. The process is architectural. Mm -hmm. We're going to show you a little bit about that, that whole process and how it was done on my double leaves duster. So taking a look at the preparation for the double leaves duster, here I start with my thought process being put into a sketch format. The thought process is the first step in the design process because everything begins with a thought. So I'm thinking of all the things I want on my garment. I want a beautiful collar. I want it to have the feeling of a late 19th century opera coat. But I also have a philosophy that what I do is timeless and what I make are things are pieces that can be worn by different generations and for different occasions. So all of that's running through my mind. But I really want to have this to be a coat that is very now, but very then as well. So I add bell cuffs as well. Looking at all those things that I'm thinking about wanting on this garment, my next thought is, so what pattern stitch will I use? I go to a stitch dictionary and I settle on the double leaves stitch. I now need to move to the next process and I want to swatch that. So I have to make sure that as I'm swatching, I'm able to see all that's going to go on with that pattern because it's a long coat. It's a lot to do. You want to make sure that everything's in place. So I want to make sure that my pattern is balanced. Once that's done, then I start swatching. The swatching process is using different yarns. Here I selected a merino and three different weights and just seeing what would give me the hand, the drape, and the structure that I want on that garment. And taking a look at this one, I decided, yes, this is the weight, which is a DK weight that I want mostly because it really gives me the crispest that I need, as well as really good stitch, stitch definition. As you can see, it's beautiful embossing of the fabric. So now I've laid out and selected, I've laid out the pattern stitch, balanced the pattern stitch. <clears throat> I've selected the yarn. 
And I now want to overlay that pattern stitch onto a silhouette. However, I also have to think about how elegant I want this piece to be and the details that have to go into the engineering of this piece. So I look at how do I shape it, for example. I want it to come in, you can see on the schematic, I want it to come in at the waist, follow the natural lines of the body for a double taper to go back out to the bust. So I'm using a combination of working within the pattern, taking stitches out, making that so that no one really sees that. It doesn't look, you don't see it with the eye. And I'm also doing needle size changes so that I'm regaging. So here we can take a look, for example, at how I'm doing the waist, how I'm making the waist come in and shape. And we see that here I have more purl stitches than I have here. Here I'm gradually decreasing them so that everything comes in very gently. We also see that concept here for the bell sleeve. Then I'm looking at how is the pattern going to run across the body? What happens when planning this sleeve when the wearer puts their arm down? And I want it to always be a continuum so that we don't see a break or something that hurts the eye when it's when we're seeing the full garment on the yes. body. So it's just flowing from the sleeve across into the body, the zigzag, and the, and the leaves are too. Yes, and that's, that's very important. Then how am I going to finish the front? And I turn to crochet just to give it a very fine edging. And you can see that here I was trying this on this edging just to see, you know, I'm going to close it with loops to give it that antique feeling. And I'm going to cover the buttons with crochet so we have the covered buttons and really giving it that mid 20th century or late 19th century opera coat feeling. So here we're also looking at the shoulders. Now something we have to keep in mind, what will happen when we start to plan from the bottom up, what will happen at the top? What will happen when the two when the back and the front are sewn together. And here I wanted to pick up just one element and have it form a diamond, actually, at the shoulders. And here you can see that as we sew the shoulders together, that each element of that will come together. And all that's very important. Also, to look at the ruffle. We added a ruffle at the top around the collar to give it a little bit more elegance and to make certain that each of the stems, as we sew this on, would match with the ruffle. And you see that the ruffle's made in the same concept, using the same concept as we did with the bell sleeve, starting again, again echoing on different parts of the garment, starting again with more width and the pearl stitches and gradually taking those down. Those are all the things that, as the person engineering, in the preparation process, which is the third step in the design process that I had to think of before I ever picked up my needles. So this is my double leaves and twists cape that was made for the 30th anniversary of Vogue Knitting. That was their pearl anniversary. So I wanted a cape that was covered with pearls. I also wanted it to be very elegant and to really be a show-stopping evening piece because 30th anniversary should be a showstopper. So as I've walked you through the process before, you can see my thought process that led me to a very wispy, very elegant looking evening cape. You can also see how I selected a pattern stitch and then how I put pearls on that. And then you see my schematic, which tells you and shows you the collar and shows you how I'd like to keep the pattern stitch running for a bit and then to take it in a different direction. So here I start swatching and based on what I'm thinking and what I've, what I've put down um, and sketched, this particular swatch gives me a very nice stitch definition, but it won't work because it's too heavy. That one was worsted. It was worsted it? weight. Yeah. yeah, and so it's too heavy. This one is the opposite. It's uh, a merino. This one was a cashmere. This is a merino. And this is more of a fingering weight, but it's too light. It's like the three bears. So <laughs> this won't work. 
And then I swatched with a mohair. And it really just gave me the definition that I was looking for and also the wispiness and the elegance that I wanted. And it looked beautiful with the pearls. The pearls don't stick out too strongly. They just sort of glisten away. Yeah, so I added the, the pearls to it and we're on track. But it was a little too heavy because it was doubled. So then I tried a single layer with the mohair and adding the pearls, and there was that, exactly what I was looking okay, for. Okay, so that was the final choice, and that's just mohair held single. Yes. Okay, and then here you've taken this pattern here and developed it, haven't you? Yes, and so what I wanted to do was to have one area that just had the beads and had just the, the sort of the top part of the pattern stitch run all the way around, and there we tried, and you can see what the results were. Right up at the yoke, which is yes. very beautiful. So yeah. it, when the collar comes up, then you get to see that top portion and you get to see all the pearls. On the end, it was just I-cord that we did and we put a finial of pearls and just a very wispy crocheted pattern going around the edging. Totally gorgeous. It is Thank an absolutely you. stunning design. Is it one of your favorite ones? It is. It happens to be the most, I think. We did it so quickly, but it was for such a special occasion and everything worked and it's one of the ones that I really love. And this yarn choice, is it's slightly variegated, but it just works so beautifully, doesn't it? It all came together. The yarn was a beautiful mohair by Prism, hand dyed by Prism, and it just came together and worked very beautifully. Welcome back. So part two of our interview with Shirley is at the end of the program. And then we have a look at some of the really beautiful designs that came out of the Design Along series. And also Shirley shows us how to take accurate body measurements, which is really important. So there's lots of good, valuable information coming up in part two as well. We both want to say a great big thank you to our viewers who have already become Fruity Knitting patrons. You are the reason that this show can exist. Mum and I both work full time on fruity knitting and just like everyone else we also need to make an income. So for those of you who love watching fruity knitting but have yet to become fruity knitting patrons, we invite you to support the show by making a small monthly contribution starting at the price of one coffee per month. Every patron makes a difference to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mum and I both work from home and working from home has lots of benefits but it can also be lonely. And I do think that lots of designers, small-scale yarn dyers, and full-time podcasters might have a lot of followers online, but spent most of their time working alone. And our quiet lifestyle becomes particularly apparent to me when we suddenly spend an intense few weeks traveling for work. So recently we covered the Swiss Yarn Festival, yeah. where we were flooded with social interaction, and I loved it, because it's such a thrill to meet people from all walks of life who have somehow ended up working in the knitting industry. Yeah, so I was thinking about that recently, which is why today I want to talk about how chronic social isolation and loneliness relate to our health and how knitting can help combat loneliness by bringing people together. <laughs> so chronic social isolation and loneliness are associated with poor mental health, like depression and anxiety, but also physical illnesses, increasing your risk for heart disease, dementia and a weakened immune system. And loneliness results when our desire for meaningful connection and interaction isn't being met. But we don't always realize that we're lonely. Some, sometimes symptoms of loneliness can be feeling unhappy or agitated throughout the day for no obvious reason. Yeah. I actually found a survey from 2021 which showed that in the US, the number of close friendships has really declined since the 90s. So the percentage of people saying they had no close friends went from just 3% in 1990 
to 12% in 2021. That's amazing. I know. And the number of people saying they had 10 or more close friendships has dropped from 33%, so a third of the population in 1990, to 13% in 2021. And I think that's a real shame because it's those lasting and close friendships that are just the best antidote against chronic social isolation and loneliness. Now, there's plenty of research on how we form and maintain friendships, typically done by social psychologists, but neuroscientists also research this, only they look at the brain. And they have discovered that just like we have a special brain circuit that regulates our hunger, we also have one that regulates our social behavior. And this does make sense to me because our ancestors who uh, were good at surviving in communities and got along with others were more likely to survive in general than those who didn't get along with others. Anyway, they named this brain circuit the social homeostasis circuit. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term homeostasis. Typically, it refers to how our body tries to balance its physiology. What have you got in your mouth? <laughs> Marker. <Yeah. laughs> anyway, so an example for homeostasis is that our core temperature should always be 37 degrees Celsius. And that means that when our body gets too hot, we sweat. If it gets too cold, we shiver. There's an example. Now, social homeostasis refers to our brain regulating the amount and type of social contact we have with others. For example, you could have lots of superficial interactions throughout the week, like just saying hi to people at the supermarket and so on, or just a few but meaningful ones, like a very long phone call with your best friend. And so the variables are quantity and quality, and together they describe a person's level of social inter interaction. Each of us has a personal ideal level of social interaction, and once that threshold is crossed, it feels like too much contact for us, and we just need some alone time to recharge again. But that ideal level varies greatly between people, and that's why we talk of introverts and extroverts, for example. That is interesting, although yeah. sometimes I think I'm a bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a spectrum, really. It's not one or the other. Um, but psychologists have also found that when we feel close to others, our physiology tends to synchronize to some extent. For example, if one person's pupils get larger, then the others would get larger as well. Or if my heart rate goes up, then your heart rate goes up as well. And apparently it can also go the other way around. So you can deepen your social bond with someone by sharing a physiological experience together. Now, I'm thinking that when you're knitting with, together with a friend, you're both going through the same simple repetitive movement, which, by the way, should also release serotonin. And this should put you in a similar physiological state. And according to this research, that could help to deepen your social bond in that moment. So there's just a food for thought. <laughs> now, apart from that, uh, knitting and, of course, other forms of crafting are also great tools for regulating your social interactions in a group setting. Now, there's a lady in, in the UK called Betson Corkhill uh, from Stitch Links, and she researches the therapeutic benefits of knitting. Betson says that knitting in a group also works well for people who prefer less direct social contact, because while you're knitting, you're holding your hands out in front of you. And this increases your personal space and can feel like a protective barrier between you and everyone else. Yep, so knitting keeps you occupied and... Um, also, you have a valid excuse not to make eye contact if that is too much for you. <laughs> and I think this can actually really help people who might have social anxiety or who just generally struggle with social interactions, maybe someone with autism, to cope in a group setting. And that's why I think knitting is awesome. Knitting keeps you occupied and it just um, lets you sort of relax around people and not have to be actively participating in the conversation. That's yeah. true. That's really true. So if you are wanting social contact but not really up to a big conversations, just yeah. take your knitting to a bustling cafe, yeah. sit in the corner, watch life go by, get a feeling of socialness, but you don't have to talk to anyone. You're yeah. hiding behind your knitting. I love knitting <laughs> in cafes. I do that a yeah. lot. Okay. Anyway, I think many of us are also um, aware that Elderly people can particularly suffer from social anxiety, no, not social anxiety, social isolation and mm -hmm. loneliness. Yeah. And I did come across a fun initiative by the smoothie company Innocent called The Big Knit. Thousands of volunteers knit and crochet these little woolen hats with crazy motives like strawberries, shark heads, and other different animals, as well as a British letterbox. And these miniature hats decorate the smoothie bottles. 
Part of the revenue from selling the smoothies is then donated to Age UK and Age UK is a charity that helps the elderly by offering social activities, befriending services and all kinds of other support including IT training and legal advice. I think it's a really fun initiative and I just like the connection between knitting and addressing the various problems that can come with being socially isolated and lonely in old age. So that's been today's pop psychology session and now you know that your mental and physical health will improve if you maintain an active social life. Yeah. <laughs> you can deepen your social bond with someone by sharing a physiological experience together. And finally, knitting is the ideal tool to connect with others, whether I... you're an introvert or an extrovert. Yes. Now, let's go back to the physiological state, sharing that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it works between our audience and us. So when our <laughs> audience is knitting and we're knitting here on the couch, we're all knitting on the couch together, do our... Um, heartbeat synchronize. <laughs> That's a very nice thought. I can't give you the answer. <laughs> that is a lovely thought. Okay. So now we're going to go straight back into under construction again, very quickly, because I want to tell you about my next project, which is also going to be a lace project. My very dear friend, Sophia Capella, who sat here on the couch with me in episode 129, is getting married in August. I am so happy and excited. We're both so happy and excited for her. We're both invited to the wedding. Mm -hmm. And at the 11th hour, I have decided to knit her a lace wedding shawl. <gasps> <laughs> so we've picked out a pattern together that she's very happy with. Here's a picture of it. It's called the Hortensia Beaded Lace Shawl. It's a beautiful, delicate lace shawl with a leafy pattern and lots of beading. I've never actually done beading in lace before, so this is going to be a strong learning curve for me. So I've been ordering everything online. I've got my one millimeter crochet hook. It actually looks more like two millimeters to me. I've got yeah. some beads. I think they're too small, so I've ordered a second lot of beads. And the yarn that I'm using is 100% cashmere lace weight, and it's in this really lovely champagne kind of color, creamy champagne color. So I've nearly got all of my equipment ready so I can start the thing. I'm incredibly excited and honored to be knitting Sophia a lace wedding shawl, but I'm also quite terrified because I have to get it done and blocked before the wedding. So I'm really hoping and wanting all of you to cross your fingers for me and wish me the best of luck. <laughs> so now with all of this lace knitting that I've been doing, I thought it's about time we started a lace knitting, a lace knit along, a carl. And I know we've done one before and I looked it up to see how long ago it was and I was surprised to see that it was six years ago in mm. 2017. So it's high time we had another lace knit along. <clears throat> and I also looked up the guidelines or rules for the knit along because Andrew wrote them back then and I think they're really good guidelines so we're going to keep them in memory of Andrew. So I will read them to, I've got them printed out here. So here are the guidelines for the knit along. It has to be either an adult garment or a large shawl or hap. Gosh, he was a bit mean, wasn't he? <laughs> At least one third to a half of the project must be in lace. And it can, of course, be 100% lace. And the knit along will take place in our Fruity Knitting Ravelry group. And it'll start on the 1st of July and it'll go until the 30th of September. Now, if there are a lot of really complicated, large, amazingly difficult projects in there, don't worry about having a deadline. I'll just add on another month or two. So don't worry about that. The main thing is that you take a challenge and we really want to encourage newbie lace knitters as well as experienced ones. Yeah. Because there's always going to be... Um, lots of experienced lace knitters in the group who are going to be there to encourage you and give you advice. So take on a challenge and join in our lace knit along. And there's plenty of easy lace projects. You can see some in our previous episodes. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so it's time for Madeline and I to say goodbye now because coming up is part two of our interview with Shirley Payden. So bye. <laughs> bye and thank you for spending time with us. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode.
inspiration for the Sazana Mimini dress came from the calm ocean waves. I created that kind of wave movement from the top to the bottom of the dress. When you wear the dress, the bottom pleats move like a wavelet on the sand. I chose the word Sazanami that means wavelet in Japanese. Shirley's off the shoulder design was the inspiration for the actual cables in my design,、uh, and I wanted to design a classic sweater around those cables,、um, one that you could wear for years to come. I named this sweater after me because I absolutely love cables, and this design is really bursting with cables. This is Iris Schreier, and I'm presenting my design called Twist and Shout, which uses a lot of very interesting twist stitches. I was super inspired by Shirley Payton's design to come up with this shawl pattern. The shawl is repetitive, so it's an easy way for you to try it. Once you master the stitch pattern, it'll be really fun to just repeat it in different colors. I am so thrilled with my design of the zigzag gauntlets. It's not a very large project, and working with gorgeous Art Yarns Merino Cloud is a pleasure. The shawl was inspired by Shirley Payton's tie front cardigan from the Vogue Knitting Holiday issue in 2006. I was inspired to make this shawl in looking at the lace pattern used in the cardigan. It reminded me of a flower just opening, both in its shape and its colors, fading from lightest to darkest. Shirley's fifth design along started with stitch patterns, beautiful stitch patterns. I chose one that looked like wings. As I knit my swatches, I realized I could make these wings travel across the front of a sweater by tipping the fabric at an angle. And with that realization, my winged surplus sweater took flight. This is Diane Martini. For the Salaria pattern, I was inspired to take two different cable and lace patterns and combine them from the border up the front to make this flame design. For the ski height cardigan, I was inspired first by the medallions pattern, and I wanted to make a cardigan that could be worn almost anywhere from the ski lodge to the office. Hence the name ski height, which means ski lodge in Norwegian. Really beautiful designs came out of the design along, so we're going to have a quick look at a selection of them now. So, Shirley, could you describe each designer's concept and any challenges that they had to overcome? So, the first we talked about was Diane Martini's Alaria pullover, and that was a bit of a challenge because she brought together two different elements from different patterns that I had. She started at the bottom with one, and then she ran a second one, just a panel from my pink ruffled garment. Through the on a diagonal, and the end result was excellent, beautiful. The second one that we talked about was Ayano Tanaka, and her beautiful sunset skirt. And for that one, the big challenge was on my original. There were four different motifs running inside a trellis, and it was having to understand how to make the pattern stitch run. And to pull the motifs out and just look at the rel- the the,、um, the trellis, and by doing that, then she realized that she could put the motifs in in any direction that she wanted, and she used a very fine yarn. It looks like it's been felted. It is really beautiful. So that was、uh, Ayano's, just a, an excellent job. The third one that we talked about was Mari Tabita's. And Mari did her linden hoodie. She actually took just the panel from、uh, the the stitch pattern, just one part of it, and she actually ran it along the front, split it, 
brought it up into the center of a hood, and then down the back from the hood and down the sleeve, the side sleeves. And her first version was going to be with it in different sections, you know, making it as a classic. And then she did the entire body together and just really brought it into a way that it could be worn really by different, on different occasions, by different generations. And we shot it that way too, on a younger person and then on a more adult person. And then you asked uh, about Olga Jankolovich's piece. And Olga uh, is a Russian woman who had actually been well-trained in um, knitwear design in Russia. And she took a pattern and deconstructed it, but used all the elements from the pattern, not just the different parts, but parts of the pattern, that double leaves pattern, pull in and parts of it expand. We have the leaves that expand. So in order to do her Primavera dress, she used parts that would expand in order to make it have more of a ruffle. And then to pull it in under the bust, she used the part that would condense and pull in. And she did just a wonderful, it's a nice, fresh, young dress that she did. And then uh, the last one that you asked about was Laura Zucate's Frost Flowers Pullover. She looked at my design that had a short repeat and she pulled out just a part of it and really elongated it so you get a huge uh, three big tiers going through and I was very surprised myself and lots of them surprised me but that one was so creative and she made that very elegant pullover that actually is it's shaped and she put together the charts in a different way so just bravo bravo to all five of them they are absolutely stunning designs, and the five that we've shown you, I think, are so individual, aren't they? They are. Yeah. yeah. And that's the idea of two creative minds coming together and just having wonderful Bouncing results. ideas off and getting yes. better and better. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. Now, I'm always keen for our viewers to learn something new with every interview. Uh, that they can directly take home and apply to their own knitting. And I know that many knitters have trouble taking accurate body measurements, particularly mm. around the upper torso. And this is something that you cover extensively in your books and your mm -hmm. courses. So I thought maybe mm -hmm. you could show us some good tips now. There's some measurements that are key and really necessary to have a comfortable fit in your garment. <clears throat> The most important that I feel are the upper body measurements, and that's because that is the movement center of your body. Most things happen with your arms moving or your head moving there. So we're gonna take some time just to make sure that when you take those measurements that they're gonna be accurate. Madeline has agreed to model for us today and to take the measurements so we can take the measurements on her body. So thank you, Madeline. My pleasure. So we're gonna start with the back mm -hmm. with the cross back measurement, which is shoulder to shoulder. I'm gonna ask Madeline to just lean forward, right, round her shoulders. I feel the bones here. So I'm gonna ask you to put your hands there, right where my hands are, and to stand up straight, good posture. And I'm gonna measure between her two fingers. Okay. So here I'm getting 14 and a half. Then I'm going to ask her to turn to the front. And I'm going to measure her. Let, let's, sorry, Madeline, let's have you turn to the back again for a moment. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask you to place this tape measure in your armpit. Make sure it comes up into your armpit. Okay. And we're going to make sure it doesn't dip in the front, that it's straight and this is why we ask you to use a to have your foundation garments on because you're going to add ease but also to use a mirror and we're going to measure from just beneath her back neck bone down to the tape measure six inches and then if you turn we're going to measure from the center of her clavicles down let's pull the tape measure up a little bit it's four and a half so we have one and a half inches as a neck depth I'm then going to take her, if you pivot for a moment for me, I'm going to take her armhole depth. That's very important. And that's going to be from the bone, from your shoulder bone down. Okay, stand up straight. Okay, that's going to give me five and a quarter. And then I'm going to take her raglan depth. And that's going to be from just below her neck bone down 
it's gonna be six and a quarter, so it's an inch difference. And that means that when we get to the shoulder bones and we wanna shape, once we reach the shoulders of our garments, we wanna shape, we're gonna to wanna to shape an inch more to accommodate the slope. And the slope is the angle between the base of your neck and your shoulder bone. So I'm gonna take this one away and I'm gonna ask you to just slide your hand along the sides of your neck. Yeah, and come down until you start to feel like a mass of muscles there and stop. And I'm gonna take a measurement between, which is six inches, between her two hands. And that's gonna be as narrow as you're gonna want your neckline to be. And if it is that narrow, you're gonna to wanna to add buttons in the back because it has to get over your head in order to accommodate the neck. So slide down a little bit more until you feel the bottom. Just slide your hand, turn your hands and slide down until you feel the bottom end of that, which is about here. Okay, there you go. And that's just as we, we go beyond the neck and to the shoulder. And that is actually nine, let's see, is it nine? It's eight and a half. That's as wide as we're gonna want before our garment's gonna encroach on the shoulder. That's as wide as we're gonna want a neckline to be. So there are some other measurements, turn front, that we'd like to have, and that would include the bust. That's very important that we expand our chest and take the bust measurement all the way around the full circumference so that if you stand, if you ever stand with your cardigan button that it won't stand ajar. That was me breathing in deeply. <laughs> okay, <laughs> breathing deeply. Hold it, we wanna come right through the center. All right, so you got 34. And then your waist, your hips, whatever your garment is going to go over, if it's gonna go over the hips, you wanna make sure that you've got the widest part of your hips measurement uh, completed. And you also, if you're gonna do a double taper where you're gonna follow the natural lines of your body, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you've got the waist measurement taken. Also, for your hand, for your wrist, you would also want to make sure that you take your hand measurement around your knuckles, just tuck under your thumb, as well as around your wrist, because you've got to get the garment over your hand in order for it to reach your wrist, just like the, the head having to come over the head in order to get to the neckline. So in my book, as well as in my crafty class, I have complete measurements, and you can take your time and take your measurements as you, as you wish. But today, I just wanted to make sure that I went through the arm, the, the most important measurements that will affect the hang and drape of your body in the upper torso. So Shirley has a workshop called Beauty and the Bead, where she teaches the techniques of bead application. But you also show how to alter an existing chart to include mm -hmm. beading, which I think is fantastic because this skill gives knitters the freedom to embellish and transform any knitting project. So can you just very quickly show us a few tips now? Yes. So there are three different ways of applying beads and preparing to work the technique, really simple. The first is a threaded method where you actually put the beads onto the yarn before you start, and then each time you reach the position where you're going to place the bead, you pull it up into position. So this is the first method that we are using um, two purl stitches, and just finding two purl stitches in the pattern, and you simply purl, place bead, purl, and that's it. And I use this method more than any other. The second is a slip stitch method. So the beads are also threaded on first. And then you slip a stitch, pull your yarn forward, pull the bead up close to the slip stitch, pull it back, and then work across the row. You haven't worked that stitch, so there's no extra height in it. You will, it will then hold the bead very tightly. The third method is a placement method, so you don't have to pre-string anything. You have to plan, though, because you need to elongate your stitch. So on the row prior to bead placement, you would do a double yarn over as you put your, your needle into the next stitch. When you reach that position on the following row, you release the yarn over, and what you'll have is an elongated stitch. You put a bead on your crochet hook, and you put the crochet hook through, pull this loop through, and your stitch is there, your bead is placed. And that is really the fastest method of um, 
placing beads on fabric. And the most spontaneous method. Yes. If you suddenly get the urge to add a bit of sparkle, you yes. can, you can yeah. do it with planning the, it. Yeah, yeah. the next. Okay, so now you're going to show us a few charts that you've altered to include beading. Yes. So just to give you some examples and to talk a little bit about beading, everyone feels that beading and lace are a natural combination, and they are. But beads can be added to anything, and they don't necessarily have to be fancy beads. They can be wooden beads. You can add them to stockinette for an emphasis. You can add them to cables. You can also look at any pattern chart and see where you would have perhaps two stitches coming together, where you might use the method that gives the pearl stitches on either side and the beads sitting in the middle, or if you have three stitches coming together, you can add the bead using the slip method and the two and, and the center stitch. Here is an example. I have the Shetland fern pattern, and you can see that this particular chart has no beads on it. And then where I'm adding beads, where I'm going to add them as a slip stitch using that method. And here you see the end result. Also, here's an example of a pattern that I felt might be um, beautiful and with beads added. This is a four ply cashmere and I'm looking at it and thinking, okay, I can make it more wispy. Here I've added beads. I've gone down to a two ply cashmere and I've added beads using the slip method for that, both on the center, or what I call the center O's, as well as in the shell pattern that picks up at the top. We've just had a little break in our recording and we've received very sad news that the PEI, Prince Edward Island Fibre Festival, has just been cancelled because of the Hurricane Fiona that's meant to come through tomorrow and on Saturday. So we're both having a little silent weep, yes. aren't we? Mm -hmm. It's very sad. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of other people are very disappointed too. Mm -hmm. But I am so thrilled that mm -hmm. you came early and that we were able to get together, meet in person and do this interview. So thank you so much, Shirley, because you have given our viewers so much knowledge. And I've been, it's been so, um, such a privilege for me to share your work on Fruity Knitting. Well, thank you, Andrea. We have been trying to do this for a few years. Yeah. And, and even in the face of a hurricane coming, I'm glad we got this out of the way, yes. that we're able to uh, talk to your, your viewers and present my things to your viewers. And I am so grateful that you've allowed me to come into their homes and to do that. Thank it's you. totally my privilege and honor. <laughs> okay, let's say goodbye to the viewers. Bye. Bye.